I want to instruct you all not to telephone me for the next little while, at least tomorrow. Uh, because Levon got up this morning and her and the dog immediately destroyed my telephone. <laughs> my flip phone is now two pieces. Yes, Fred has it. He can show it to you. I decided to shoot the dog. I haven't figured out what to do with my wife yet. <laughs> But uh, be advised, I don't have a phone right now. I don't have a phone. 281.
the topic of multitasking, I don't know why you didn't say what, though, Jim. <laughs> How you can uh, play the harmonica and the guitar at the same time baffles me. Baffles me. I have trouble breathing and playing the radio at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no, apparently not. 83. <laughs> 83 relates to this morning's message. It's just a chorus. <laughs>
always sing, it's always beautiful. How come I never had an elementary school teacher with a voice like that? <laughs> Mine always had a grouchy sound. <laughs> Scratchy, loud, and grouchy. Yes. Beautiful. Well, bless the Lord, every one of you. Amen. I'm looking for pain this morning. Uh, I'll probably inflict some pain on you just listening to me, but uh, I'm looking for pain uh, in your memory. Um, I want you to think back in your memory were you ever sold out by a friend? Were you ever sold out by a friend? Uh, a number of years ago, uh, lots of time ago, probably 30 years ago, uh, you know, those little cliches, they travel in circles, everybody hears them, you know, until finally everybody's tired of hearing it and then they move on to the next little cliche, whatever. Uh, so some of you may remember the great illustration that was going around uh, a Jewish father. A Jewish father had his young son stand on the top of a ladder, blindfolded. And then he said to him, jump to me now, son. When the son jumps, the Jewish father just stands back and lets him hit the ground. And the crying kid looks up with his blindfold off, and the Jewish father says to him, that's just to teach you never to trust anybody. I don't know whether that uh, was a very popular story in your circle or not, uh, but I remember that being told, not very complimentary toward a Jewish father, obviously. But about the same time, right after that little cliche traveled the circuit, Youth groups grabbed a hold of that and modified it. And some of you might remember that. And they would take somebody like Owen, have him stand on top of a rock or something, and they would circle around him, and he would be asked to close his eyes and just fall backwards. And we'll catch him. And they would. I mean, obviously that was their point, is that We'll be there. We'll be there for you. We won't let you fall. We'll be there for you. And, you know, they did that in every youth group probably for a couple of years until uh, everybody had done it and it kind of lost its great significance. But it was a pretty popular thing. Have you ever been sold out by a friend? Uh, I remember a time... Uh, I acted on a friend's advice. A friend, I asked a friend a question about a certain process, and uh, the friend assured me that he was giving me the right answer, and uh, I believed him, and I acted on his counsel. And the project went completely wrong. I mean, it didn't work. It was completely wrong. And a group of individuals were standing there, my friend being among them, uh, making fun of the failure of my experiment. And I wasn't there, but I was told later my friend said, well, you need to understand, Kurt's kind of impetuous, that's just who he is. Wait a minute, jerk. <laughs> I only did that because you said it was going to work. It didn't work. Not, not, not a lot of friend to be, not a lot of fun to be sold out by a friend. Um, one of the most famous of all betrayals was that of Julius Caesar. There really was a Julius Caesar. That's not just a Shakespearean play. There was a Julius Caesar. We really don't know when he was born. Somewhere around 100 BC, about 100 years before Christ was born, Julius Caesar was born. 
By the way, good morning everybody out there in Wonderland. Uh, we have a brand new $20,000 camera. So you can see us better and hear us better, and it didn't cost near that much. But, but christy has got a brand new camera up there. She was so proud of it. She came up, she says, this camera is so good that I can turn you completely off and only hear the people. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Just exactly what I was hoping she'd come up with. But we're glad to have you guys out there. We're glad, we're glad to have you. So Julius Caesar was born about 100 years before Christ. And he entered political life when he was about 40, somewhere uh, around 60 BC. Now, he really was a great emperor. Julius Caesar proved to be a great emperor. Uh, he actually gets credit for bringing the empire together. <coughs> the empire became its own underneath Julius Caesar. He really did a great job. So, he became famous for not only, even to this day, Julius Caesar is considered one of the most brilliant military generals of all time. Uh, he was just a military genius. But beyond just being a military genius, he was a very forgiving individual. Um, Julius Caesar is, is credited with improving the lot of common people enormously in the empire, and he was famous for forgiving his enemies. Not something that everybody does well, uh, but Julius Caesar did. Uh, he was good at forgiving his enemies. Uh, then in 44 BC, I think I'm correct, I don't think I wrote it down, but I think I'm right. Uh, you can check this, Steve. Uh, uh, in, in, in 44, I think in 44 BC, Julius Caesar was walking into the Senate building when a group of the people who he had befriended, who he had forgiven, who he had pardoned, the people to whom he had given the most, the people who owed him the most, attacked him, brutally stabbing him, over 20 stab wounds on the body when he was dead because they weren't sure he was going to be good in the years to follow. They thought he might turn a little too dictatorial, and so they killed him right there. And of course, the famous line, you too, Brutus, uh, as he's dying, he sees his friend Brutus, who he had given much to, and who had much to be thankful to Caesar for. Uh, he too had a knife in his hand, and was also one of those who was killing him. So, that was a very famous betrayal. Uh, not the only famous betrayal. Uh, there are others. Uh, I'm looking in Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. You know where I'm heading with this one. Uh, but it certainly was a famous betrayal. Uh, they've had the Last Supper. Matthew chapter 26. And they are on their way out to the garden. And on the way, Jesus told them, Tonight, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee, and I will meet you there. Peter declared, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. To which Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter insisted, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. 
And all the other disciples vowed the same thing. Wow. They all vowed the same thing. And yet within hours, we know, <laughs> within hours, you couldn't find any of them. They had all abandoned him. They had all departed. They had all denied him. Here they were friends who had traveled with him faithfully for three years. They had been there through all of the, the good and the bad and the miracles and the healings and the everything. They had seen it all. Yet here, even though Peter has promised, if I have to die with you, I will gladly do that. I will die with you rather than to ever betray you. I will stay with you. Another very famous betrayal, of course, was when Abel's brother Cain not only betrayed him, but killed him. We tend to think family loyalty is worth a lot. Family loyalty is important. Christ warned us that in spiritual affairs, our family might be, in fact, our enemy more than our friend. And when it comes to spiritual things, people aren't as loyal as you might think they would be. Now, there's no honest historian out there who denies the life of Christ. I mean, read the worst historian there is out there, and he'll acknowledge there was a man, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever come across a historian who just flat denies the existence of a man called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Everybody accepts that. Everybody accepts that then where is the problem? Well, the problem arises when you ask them who you think Jesus was. And as soon as you pose that question, things change. Up until then, we're all in agreement. Yep, there was a Jesus of Nazareth. We can even agree that they set the calendar by his life. But we're not going to agree when it comes to who he was. Go to Luke chapter 9, and this is one of those stories that's in all the Gospels, but I cho chose it in Luke chapter 9. Starting with verse 18. One day Jesus left the crowds to pray alone. All of his disciples were with him. Then he asked them, who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, some say you are John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others yet say you are one of the ancient prophets risen from the dead. And then Jesus asked them, but who do you say? I am. Peter replied, you are the Messiah sent from God. King James. Peter answered saying, the Christ of God. The Christ of God. You are the Christ of God. Who do people claim that I am? Uh, some thought he was John the Baptist. They didn't have television. Not everybody had seen John the Baptist. He was famous. But not everybody had seen him. So perhaps this is he. This might be him. This might be John the Baptist. Others claim Elijah. Elijah predicted that he would return at a point in time. And this is he that is him returning. Others simply thought that it was one of the ancient prophets unknown to them but that he was back and that he was now with them once again. One of the footnotes in one of my study Bibles takes us from that discussion there in Luke chapter 9. It takes us back to Luke chapter 2. And 
investigates the same question. Bear in mind that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, God had been silent for over 400 years in Israel. The prophets were gone, the writings were closed, and there was a 400 year period of silence. And the Jews had been looking historically for a Messiah for centuries. For centuries they've been planning, they've been counting on a deliverer, one who would come, one who would come. <coughs> But they had different ideas about who he would be and what he would do. Many people were really only looking for a political redeemer. Somebody who would come and get rid of Rome. Get them out of our face. Let us be independent once again. I was unaware as I read a number of them really only believed in a Messiah who would be a doctor. I mean, he would come about and he would cure and heal. And that would be his ministry. That's who he would be. He would be a healer. He would be a cure for diseases. Then there were those who were still anticipating the promise given to Abraham. They were still looking for the promise given to Abraham. Abraham takes his boy up to the mountain to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, there on the mountain. And he is about to plunge the knife into him when he is told that God will supply the sacrifice himself. A forerunner of Jesus Christ. So, a number of Jewish people are still looking for the promise to Abraham to be fulfilled, to come forward. Verse 20 says, and who do you say I am? So that's who the people think I am. They think I'm John the Baptist. They think maybe I'm Elijah. And they think maybe I am the, the prophet of old. Who do you say that I am? And Peter responds immediately, you are the Christ of God. You are that Messiah promised long ago. Let's go to Luke chapter 2 and look at this. Luke chapter 2. Now there were shepherds, beginning with verse 8. Now there were shepherds in the same country, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. Uh, they were greatly afraid. <coughs> nearly always when angels appear, the response is fear. In nearly every situation, uh, and we are, we are told, be careful how you treat strangers because you might be entertaining angels unaware. But the angels that appear in most of the situations in our scripture appear in such a way that they do not look like just a stranger that you haven't met. When they show up, you know you're being visited by God. Okay? Uh, this angel appears, and suddenly the glory of the Lord shone round about them, indicating that not only did this individual appear to them, but there was a, an atmosphere change so dramatic that they knew they were standing in the presence of God. They were standing. How many shepherds were there? There's a quiz question. How many shepherds were there? The answer is two. Uh, why is there two? Because you never saw in the city. How many shepherds back there, Scott and that? Should be two. Two. Two, see? <coughs> they wouldn't put three because there were three wise men. Why were there three wise men? Because one had gold, one had frankincense, and one had myrrh. So there must have only been three. There might have been six. See, there were two with gold. Two with... No, there were three. Because there's a nativity scene got it in it. 
and there were just two shepherds. We don't have a clue. We don't have a clue. There were shepherds. There were shepherds. That means more than one. There were shepherds. They were abiding by their flocks, and suddenly an angel appears, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. Don't be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Okay? This is who God says he is. God is announcing who he is. This is audible. They hear it. They know it. It's there. It's real. And this shall be a sign unto you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Then suddenly there was with the angel a multitude. How many was that? Five. <laughs> all nativity, all expanded nativity scenes just have five angels. <laughs> There was a multitude. That could have been a lot. The heavens lit up with a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Wow. This is who God says Jesus is. This is who he says he is. This is the Christ. This is the promise. This is the sacrifice that I promised to Abraham. This is he. This is God. This is the Messiah. He has come. He is one of you. Luke chapter 3. That's only one page further over. Okay? One page further over. Luke chapter 3, verse 21. 30 years have passed. 30 years have passed. Now, that first time he announced the shepherds. He announced the shepherds. Why didn't he announce it to Herods and kings? Because he's always presented himself to the lowest of people. He came to the lowly shepherds. Now, 30 years later, 30 years later, Luke chapter 3, verse 21. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, and the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. Once again, he is proclaiming this is the Messiah. This is the Christ. The Christ sent from God. They hear it. All the people being baptized. They were not alone. There was a group being baptized. And there Jesus joined them. And together, as they, as they were there, they saw the heavens open up. Something happened in the sky. And they saw the Holy Spirit descending and it settled upon him like a dove. We don't know for sure what that means. It settled upon him like a dove. They saw the Spirit rest upon him. And then they heard the voice of God, the voice of God, proclaiming that, in fact, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son. So 2,000 years have passed. The debate goes on. Who is he? Who is he? To lots of people, he's just a, a name in a book. He's nothing more than a name in a history book. That's all he is. Um, how do you see Jesus? Uh, how, how do you see him? Um, perhaps you see Jesus as the judge of the district court. Uh, we're coming into the courtroom now, all rise. Um, is that how you see him? Is, is your Jesus just the judge who's going to 
judge you. Uh, you may seem as the ticket taker at the fair. He's the ticket taker at the fair. If you got a ticket, uh, if you got a ticket, you can come in. Without a ticket, you can't come in. Is that who he is to you? Who is Jesus in your heart? Who is he? Uh, Lloyd Tillman asked me a dumb question one time. Uh, Lloyd had lots of dumb questions. Uh, questions that he knew you didn't have an answer for. Uh, but I remember he said, how big is the moon? I said, what do you mean how big is the moon? Well, he said, how big does it look to you? Is that a tennis ball? Uh, so we debated for a while how big we thought the moon was. He finally gave me the answer. He said, it's about as big as a quarter. <laughs> oh, really? It's about as big as a quarter. You see, we can have different perceptions of who Jesus is. Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. And yet he was a friend that he wanted by him all the time. Not just, not just the judge in the courtroom. Not just the ticket taker. But somebody to eat with. Somebody to fellowship with. In the book of Revelations, Jesus says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And behold, if any man will open up unto me, I will come in. And I will fellowship with him. God wants that relationship with us. He's not just Jesus, the little baby in that manger back there. And he's not just the judge. And he's not the ticket taker. But he is the one friend who will never leave you. He will never abandon you. He will never forsake you. Amen. Though the disciples all forsook him, he never forsook them. And that's who he wants to be blessed today. I hope he is your best friend. I hope you speak to Jesus 20 times a day. I hope every time you're making a decision, <coughs> You pray, oh God, Lord Jesus, help me decide which way to go here today. Help me decide what to do. Lord Jesus, forgive me for that blunder. I shouldn't have said that. God, thank you for giving me the right answer there. Oh Lord, thank you that I didn't shoot my wife when I broke when she broke the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? I want him to be your savior. Absolutely, I want him to be your savior. But I don't want him to be some formal person in the courtroom who <coughs> redeemed you. He wants to be way more than that. He wants to be way more than that. He wants to be that one who sticketh closer than a brother, who's closer than any family member, closer than anybody you've ever met in your life. He is there. He doesn't take you out and get you on a limb and then abandon you. He will be there <coughs> beginning to win. Stand with me. This Christmas, who is Jesus for you? There's a, there's a handful of bumper stickers over there. They actually take the same line out of Matthew that says, Who do you say I am? You know, not exactly what that verse says, but, but there's bumper stickers over there. Uh, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? To each of us, that's a question. Who do you say that I am? And I pray that you can say, you are my Savior. You are my Redeemer. You are my Messiah. You are my best friend. You are the one that I love more than anything else on the face of this earth. And this Christmas season, I will put you in the first place above all else that I have in my life. You are first. Heavenly Father. Lord, the question's been asked for thousands of years. Who is Jesus? I pray not one of us here would simply think that you are a man from history. 
I pray that every one of us here and out there online proclaim you as the Christ of God, the Messiah. But more than that, I pray that we would say, you are my Redeemer. You are my Savior. You are the Christ, the Messiah. And you are my best friend. Oh, Father, thank you that in all of the trials of life, though we may be abandoned by many, we shall never be abandoned by Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for your great love. May we celebrate Christmas with great joy, knowing that the Christ has come. You are here. You are among us. And you walk with us this day. You live with us in our hearts. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.